Well, hello, everybody. Here we are in lovely Las Vegas at the Microsoft uh, Mix 2011 conference in the Mandalay Bay. And, and as always, uh, this is Michael Cote with Red Monk. And I've got a guest with, with, uh, with me. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks, Michael. My name is Ziad Ismail. I am the Director of Product Management for Internet Explorer. The first day of Mix was, I'm, I'm trying to replay it through my mind, but it was pretty much all about IE to, to a large extent. There was some, some uh, uh, CMS things and, and other stuff. But you guys opened out talking a lot about uh, IE, IE9, and IE10 coming up. And, and, and I wonder if you could kind of give a recap of what you talked about in the Internet Explorer area. Sure. So there were, there were two things that we talked about. The first one was the availability of IE10. IE10 comes just four weeks after we announced IE9 at South by Southwest. IE10 is really just a continuation of the, the bets and the path we set out with IE9, which is a, a bet on standards and HTML5 and, and uh, other web standards, and focusing on really driving performance forward to enable a completely new class of web experiences. The second thing is uh, we laid out our vision for native HTML5. The idea behind native HTML5 is what web developers want to do is they want to use web standards because they're developing across a broader and broader set of different platforms, different form factors. But they also want the kind of performance and experience they get from native applications. So bringing together the best of those two things, standards plus all the performance plus all the experience, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, with IE9, with Windows 7, and that's the path we're going down with IE10, and essentially really raising the bar on what the web can do. Can you explain what you mean by native HTML5? I mean, what's, what's the native part? The native part is really focusing on taking full advantage of the hardware and operating system you've bought, th that you've already bought. If you think about uh, where we were with IE9 just a year ago, one thing we found is that most websites only used about 10% of the power that was available on the PC. Uh, you look at the GPU and think about how much games have changed in the past 10 years. So there are all these new capabilities. Those things we made available to the browser and new types of really rich experiences are now possible in the browser because of those kind of bets. Native HTML5 is just taking that even one step deeper and completely optimizing how we build the browser to take full advantage of the operating system and the hardware. And specifically for us, that means making a huge bet on IE9 with Windows 7 today, and going forward, it'll be IE10. Performance is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is about the experience and how the application and how the thing you're building in the web actually looks and feels on your, on your computer. The work we've been doing with IE9 actually lets you take websites and pin them to your taskbar, and now they look and feel like native applications. And it's not just a bookmark. It's now what you'd expect from an application which drives notifications. So if you get a new email and you've pinned Hotmail, it tells you, hey, you've got a new uh, email and you can jump back into that application. If you're running Facebook and you get some new messages, you get a notification. If you're on eBay and you get a bid, you know, same kind of things happen. Native is partially the performance side. The other part of the coin and what developers want to do is not have their experiences necessarily restricted by the browser box itself. Like, like think about the browser box. It was created like in 1993, like the first Sometime mosaic browser. That. Yeah, whatever, right. whatever. Like 1990, we're still living with it. Like it's still like, I want to go to a website. Hey, I fire up the browser. I type in a URL. I go there. Um, there is no real need for it to be that way. Like if I know that I love you know, ESPN or Facebook, why do I need to take a completely different path to get there than I would do if I had a Facebook application or an ESPN application? Uh, and so the web just becomes a lot more interesting when you put the focus on the websites themselves right. and you let the browser only be there if it actually needs to be there. If you think about it, like the web technologies and the websites are what's really, really interesting. The browser itself, like unless it's actually adding value to the experience, there is, it doesn't really need to appear. It doesn't really need to show up. So although we are, you know, we're excited about the progress we're making with IE9 and, you know, you know we, we love the browser, uh, where it doesn't make sense. Like, we, we don't really care if the user sees that it's an IE browser. The thing we're focused on is, as a Windows user, are you getting an amazing web experience? And if that means the browser kind of fades into the background where it makes sense, like, we will push that. The phrase HTML5 has, has meant a lot of things over the past 
I don't know, maybe two years. I, I'm bad with it, with the timeline of it, but uh, it's, I, it's, it's probably gone through at least three or four different uh, meanings to people. <laughs> right. And, and as, as the, the spec and all of the sub-specs evolve. And, and, and I'm curious, I mean, we, we talked about what the native part of native HTML5 is. And when, you, when, when the IE team is working on implementing HTML5, <laughs> another, another tenuous phrase, as it were, right. like what, what are you thinking about what is HTML5 in that sense? I mean, what, you know, kind of both in the sense of the features that you're providing and how you're tracking the spec. It's probably one of the most problematic terms that we're dealing with at this point as we're trying to um, teach developers about what we're doing with i9 and kind of get people excited about what's coming next. HTML5 is, at its core, it's two different things. One is it's a specific specification it's driven by the W3C. Uh, there's a working group. The specification is going to hit last call in May, and W3C has said they are targeting a recommendation, which is the same thing as a standard by 2014. So that's the actual document that's being written. HTML5 is also used as a simplified term for the broader web platform that allows users to do you know, the next generation of exciting stuff on the web. And that's right. everything from you know, the HTML5 spec itself, CSS, it's things like WebSockets, it's things like IndexedDB, it's DOM, it's JavaScript, which isn't even part of W3C. And so it's an umbrella term for about, you know, 50 or so different specifications. Um, and so it causes a tremendous amount of, amount of confusion. And some people have tried to try to, you know, change back the terminology. I know W3C was trying to push open web platform at some point. Um, it's not clear that it's not clear that it's actually going to be possible to change it. Right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of one of the uh, the horses are out of the barn kind it's, of problem. It has it has so much momentum. It's being used constantly, and from a communication standpoint, certainly when you try to explain things to broader consumers, if you're not saying what everybody else is saying, and you're saying open web open web platform rather than HTML5. Um, people may not really understand what you mean because HTML5, the umbrella term has, has, you know, has some values, has some positive associations which are already out there. It, historically, it's it, it's highly analogous to AJAX, <laughs> which, which which you know it or Web oh, 2.0. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I mean, all all of these terms started out as a uh, as sort of meaning the next big thing. Yes. <laughs> or or the evolution of of. You know, in the case of AJAX, the evolution of web applications, and in Web 2.0, kind of the evolution of what you do with web and applications. Then, and then everybody wants to use them rather than inventing something new because there's a bunch of yeah. positive association in, in reusing those words. And so the meaning gets stretched, and at some point, it doesn't quite mean what it meant originally, and nobody really knows what it means, but it's still going to be used. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I think you're right that it is, uh, you know, I, I, I always feel a little uh, upset when I hear the phrase, and I would use the phrase HTML5, but at this point, I think I just need to get over it. it like, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like, it, it means a loosely definable collection of stuff. And to your point, like when you say it, people understand what you're talking about if they can't precisely say what it is. <laughs> right, no, I, I agree. It, I, it just means like the new way of developing web applications, essentially. Yeah, I, I should say the thing that gets, um, I think the thing that gets messy for me is not when people use the HTML5 word as a, mean, as a meaning for the broader web platform, yeah. it's when they start confusing which one they actually mean. And people say things like, hey, HTML5 is not going to be ready until 2022. Or HTML5 is not going to be ready until 2014. Well, which one are you referring to, actually? Yeah. Are you referring to the spec? Or are you saying, actually, don't use any technologies in this, in this broader web platform? Are you saying JavaScript and CSS will all be ready at some magical date on January 1st, or if it's Christmas Day or whatever it is, that's when it gets really messy because um, it just causes tremendous amount of confusion. And you know, people that are excited about you know the next web platform don't really understand what's going on, and they say, "Well, maybe I should just hold off a bit until just people do, know what's going do on." Do some more of that Ajax stuff, right? <laughs> and build another web 2.0 site. That's right. One of the challenges I think in browser innovation, web application, has always been balancing the need for using an exciting new piece of functionality or spec that's out there, and also balancing that against the stability of it being done and released. And I mean, that's, that's really playing out in the HTML5 space quite a bit now, where there's, 
I mean, you know, to use the old analogy, there's, there's the work that you guys and other browsers are doing is kind of like changing, a, a, you know, the wings on an airplane while it's flying. And there's, right. there's a lot of figuring out how you start using the spec, when, or if you use it too early, or if you're too late. And so, you know, you know, first off, in, in doing the work at looking at how users are using it, how, how do you see people balancing out or dealing with all of that in-flight specification that's going on? So it's, it's something we spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about. We looked at the experience we had with IE6 and kind of the challenges that we are running into, web developers are running into, companies are running into, with trying to get that thing out of the market. Um, there, is a, there is a true benefit in experimenting and prototyping with early specifications. Like, it needs to happen. The big question is, what's the right format for doing that? Is the right format for doing that in the browser itself, or do you find some other vehicle uh, for doing that experimentation? The reason you need to do it is, if, if, if you don't do it, you're just writing a piece of paper, the specification, and you have no idea how this thing is actually going to perform uh, once you take it into the real world and write the code. So implementation is critical. W so where we came out was, we need a stable web platform. Like, if we don't yeah. have a stable web platform, people are going to keep saying, hey, when is this thing going to be ready? My site broke. How am I going to deal with it? That platform is IE9. That platform will, will be IE10. HTML5 Labs is a place where we're going to prototype. We're going to do things that are bleeding edge. You don't actually want them in the browser. We recently announced that we're going to build Media Capture API, which is a very early draft of a specification. Uh, and we're going to do that inside the HTML5 labs. And as those things graduate, we move them into the browser. Uh, but by keeping this clean separation, we're able to actually get the best of both worlds, like advance the web standards process right. and make sure that people can build on the web standards platform today with confidence, things don't break, and it actually works. Internet Explorer is one of the more uh, historied web browsers out there. And, and one of the things I, I like about the the approach that you're going over there is, is uh, you guys have learned from the past. <laughs> it's a great point. I mean, you have to choose. Do you want the IE6 type experience to happen again, where we have a bunch of specs that get locked in and we have to deal with them, uh, not only in enterprise, which has been the past, but now the same thing is playing out in phones that aren't getting upgraded. Yeah. It's going to happen in TVs. And the web is moving to all these other places. Like, do you want the IE6 experience? Uh, and, and people are saying, hey, I really have issues with IE6. And, and I understand why people have issues with IE6. Like, I, I, you know, I feel the pain. We want, it away. we want to get rid of it as much as anyone. Um, but at the same time, some of those same people will say, hey, I really, really have issues with IE6. Same people will say, hey, why aren't you putting WebSockets into your browser? Well, guess yeah. what? We put WebSockets into the browser. We put this out there. We can put caveats around it and say, hey, you know, please don't use WebSockets. Please don't. Once it's in the browser, it lands in enterprise. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get into phones. It's going to get into new, kind of all the new appliances that are coming out, things like TVs. And it'll get locked in there. And browsers aren't going to get updated. And we're going to have to write to WebSockets version 75 for the next 10 years. <laughs> That's another thing that, that I, I've noticed about IE is that the, the process has gotten more open, if you will. I mean, you, you, you definitely, like, you talked about IE 10 during this, which is, you know, in the future compared to IE 9. It, we're, but you guys are a lot more open about inviting people into the process of, of the browser evolution, which I think is, you know, and, and that's, been, that's what you want if you depend on a platform. Yeah, absolutely. And it's been, you know, invaluable to us to actually get the feedback. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the partner side and actually having sites tell us, hey, I'm, I'm developing this experience. Like, is this actually working for you or not? Like, tremendously valuable feedback. We also have the, uh, the Microsoft Connect program where, you know, anybody can, can submit a bug and say, hey, here, here's something I'm discovering. The whole point of the platform previews is, you know, we can put stuff into the platform previews that looks like, you know, something that's going to get into IE10 and something we really want to get into IE10. And then we have a period of time to get feedback, stabilize it, work with the W3C to make sure there's actually a test suite. So we don't only say that, you know, we've implemented it. There's actually some, you know, standards-based way of measuring whether we're interoperable with the spec or not. Another thing that you guys are doing is, is you're basically building out test suites to, to test compatibility and performance of various HTML5 things. And that's, that's another nice openness of the platform that I, that I think you guys are doing. So can you, can you just kind of quickly go over what those, those test suites are? Yes. So, you know, there are lots of in interesting things happening within the standards bodies, like the, you know, the things that are going on in ECMA, the things that are going on in W3C. 
But in parallel to the actual standards process, which is what a lot of people focus on, like this, the specs themselves, what's being developed within these standards groups are our test suites. So if you go to um, test 262, for example, test 262 is a test suite for ECMAScript, uh, ECMAScript 5. Um, what's interesting about that is it's 10,000 tests just for ECMAScript 5, for right. JavaScript. It's 10,000 test cases. Uh, and you can run your browser, like run IE10 Platform Preview 1, run Chrome, run Safari, and you can actually say, does my browser measure up to the specification itself? Like anybody can say that, hey, we are you know, HTML5, whatever that means. We are betting on HTML5, we're gonna invest in HTML5. Ultimately, things like a test suite tell you whether you're just saying it or whether you're actually doing the hard work to make right. it happen. It tells you how HTML5 you are, <laughs> to, how, to what exactly, degree. Yes. Um, because supporting a standard is not a yes or no, it's really like how well are you doing it. Right. And so, you know, the way I think about it is, there are millions and millions of developers out there. You can either fix the problem once at the browser level, or you can push that problem out and millions and millions of developers have to deal with it every single day. As, as far as the testing and things. As, right. as far as testing, yeah, I built something, hey, it's acting a little bit unpredictably in browser A compared to browser B. I'm not sure what to do. Right. Um, what, you know, the right model is build a test suite, you test your browser against it, and now when a developer builds, you know, much less of their code is gonna be code that's used to test all the anomalies. To experiment with what's available. It's right, it's, it's gonna be more like productive code, real productive code. I mean, we heard from a customer recently that as they were looking at HTML5 and deepening their, their bets on the web, they did, a, they did an analysis of how much of their code was actually productive code that was doing something meaningful as opposed to handling special cases. You know, you look at CSS gradients, it's handled in a completely different way across every single browser. Um, it turned out that about 20 to 30 percent of their code was productive code. Yeah. Everything else was, okay, guess what? I'm trying to do this functionality and it's different in every single browser. It's, or it's, it's similar, but it acts a little bit different in each browser, and, and that difference actually matters to me. Right, right. It's, it's a bunch of if, else, and glue code all the way down, right? Just right. tons of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so, so, you, so you think about this. This, I think, is one of the most interesting developments in interoperability, like actually getting the test suites in there. And you compare the 10,000 test cases in just this one test suite for one standard to some of the tests that people are citing. You, you look at something like ACID3. Like, ACID3 is interesting, but ACID3 tests a very wide range of specs, like 10 to 20 specs with 100 or so test cases. Right. So like a very small, you know, five to 10 tests per, per, per standard. The issue with that is, you know, we can pass ACID3, every browser in the world can pass ACID3, but we may not be interoperable at all. We're interoperable at, you know, at the 1% level, on 99% of the spec we're completely different. And so, you know, when we talk about interoperability, like, the real value is shifting that mix of productive code to go from 20 to 30 percent to something much, much bigger. And you know, W3C and ECMA, they're, they're leading the way. And Microsoft, together with other browser vendors, are supporting them in building out these test suites. I, I appreciate you taking all this time to go over IE stuff. I mean, I, I, I was especially interested to talk with, with you about it because I feel like, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, you guys have built a new platform, if you will, to develop applications on beyond just a browser that web applications surface in. There's really a lot more functionality. There's a lot more to the parts assembled, I guess is what I'm saying, than, uh, than just a, a portal that you're viewing some HTML through. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it, was, it was good to uh, get that overview from you. Definitely. Well, thanks. Great to be here. Yeah. Thank you.